Part 3 Chapter 8 Awakening of a Nation March brings back to me the times of my youth over four decades ago. I was a buddy of my elder brother, Kudrat Mejubhai, a couple of years older. In our culture, age difference is important in determining terms of relationship between siblings, but it seemed to have lost that propriety when we aged, presumably because the difference fell as in proportion to our age. I was upgraded to join his friend's circle, Muhammad Ali, Mojid, Sarwar, Dulal, Mizan et al., all bhaiyas to me. I met a girl, he said one day. I jumped at the news. I hope she's pretty. You have bad eyesight. You know I'm six by six with my glasses. She's perfect, chic, smart, and can sing too. Oh, you even heard her singing, but did not care to take me along? I said resentfully, cursing the card game for having taken away precious little time for such a nobler cause. I can't risk taking you. You know many stories of how they flip their choice. He said jokingly and continued. The problem is that she is half Bengali and half West Pakistani. I'm told the government gives a handsome gift for such interwing marriages that cement Pakistan Council. Innovation. Haha. <laughs> Get a wife and a bonus. Agdile dui paki, I commented. I guess you can take that chance. I want to cement my life, not the country. I pressed. Better hurry. You're already over 28. Your hairline is receding and your net worth has peaked. Thanks for the worldly advice, he replied with a mild punch on my shoulder. At times, Mejubai would toss off an expensive pack of three castle cigarettes to me, to my immense delight, although he had stopped smoking. Often after dinner, we would go out for a stroll along the quiet roads of Bonani, with occasional rabbits crossing the streets being the only distractions. Sometimes we would talk about serious issues. Mejubhai was a voracious reader. That's how he got his eyesight terribly impaired. I wonder where all your readings take you, I commented one night. Reading is an unbounded search for the unknown. Moreover, you get to know your past, present, and I dare say a glimpse of future too. Else you are without coordinates, culture, emotional, historical. Major surfaced from the depth of his thinking and added, The world around us and that of our ancestors unravel with richness and depth. You can relate yourself from the distant star to a blade of grass. And above all, reading is a pleasure. To make the conversation lighter, I added, but your pleasure has taken a serious toll on your sight. That's why I value the sight so much. You have seen the care I take now. The eye drops, exercises and all that. You mean the Reader's Digest stuff? I hinted at the source of his medical inspiration. Good, you seem to have broadened your reading interest. I hope the religious bhoot has left you. He commented endearingly, referring to my years of religious pursuits. I do not quite agree. Religious enquiries have immensely befitted me, I paused. Go ahead. I needed to go to the depth of our religion for my own sake. You live only one life and got to have some perspective that you can hold on to. That's why Hinduism offers many lives through incarceration, Mejubha equipped. Let's not digress. Spirituality aside, you need some code of conduct to govern your life, to distinguish truth from falsehood, right from wrong, just from unjust. That's conscious. You think people do not have conscious if they are not religious and I guess according to you Muslims, we retorted sarcastically. You got me wrong. It's different for different people. But I dare say that if you design your code, you run two risks. Other people may not share yours and you may rationalize your own conduct to suit you. Society needs a common platform to function. For that, we have laws, customs and traditions to guide us. Mejufai was not about to concede. What do you do when the laws are unjust, imposed and shields of tyranny? Pakistan is a monumental travesty of legal reasoning. I was happy to have found a suitable answer. 
it's getting late. You win tonight, but we shall get back to it on another night. I hope you have started thinking out of your box. Mejo Pai started. What exactly do you mean? There are a lot of good people and exemplary deeds that are not captured on your radar. I'm often amazed by the dedication of, say, the Christian missionaries who go off, who would go to far off islands, spend their lives caring for people struck with leprosy, from whom we run away at the first sight, often with panic. You remember the only hospital worth going to in Jashore was Fatima Hospital run by the missionaries. I just finished a novel where the father had to finally share the plight of those in his care, I mean literally, and died in great pain but without regrets. Mejubhai finished with a long sigh as if he had just returned from the funeral of the father. I appreciate such service to humanity, but mind you, they also came to proselytize the poor, particularly those who had no hopes. There you are. If someone brings hope to the hopeless, don't you think it's worth appreciating, even imitating? Mejubhai felt disappointed. I was not about to give in. Yes and no. If their help is without any condition, then it's yes. But if it comes with strings, no. You remember how the East India Company, in the grab of evangelical mission to bring enlightenment to the Indian living in the dark era, made a colony of India for imperial exploitation, which lasted nearly two centuries. Mejubhai had his own piece of evidence too. I agree that the British Raj siphoned off wealth and jobs from this subcontinent and built its glittering cities and industrial hubs. But you cannot be unequivocal about it. There were some benefit spin-offs too, particularly in light of the caste system that had been strangulating the subcontinent. Look at the admirable Shoti Daho, burning the young widow on the funeral pyre of her departed husband. The British abolished it. And many of the leaders of the Indian independence movement, Gandhi, Nehru, Jinnah, et al. were trained in elite English schools and traditions, even traveled to the shores of England when a voyage by the sea would make one outcast in Hindu society. Mejubhai came up with one last but unassailable argument. Let me add my modest understanding of Islam. I guess in Surah Bakara and in few more places of the Quran, it is said, those of you meaning the followers of Prophet Muhammad, the Jews, the Christians, and the Sabines who believe in one God, the day of judgment, and do good deeds. Great rewards await them from God, and let them have no fear, nor will they regret. Does it make you look kindly at other religions? I had no answer. Mejubhai's inheritance of years of reading always gave me yet another way of looking at life, at events, but I had an apprehension that faced with real-life situation, he may be much too romantic to glean over the risk that may come along. His was a life, crossing the line for saving humanity. Mid-1960s, I was a lecturer of economics at Dhaka University, preparing for the CSS examination, the most coveted path to quick and assured success in the elite Pakistani bureaucracy. Although still an onlooker, I could not help noticing the gathering of storms in the horizon centering on the political and economic demands of East Pakistan. At the core was a six-point demand, also seen as the charter of autonomy, spearheaded by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. I can see from the veranda of my cell the begrailed six modest columns raised on the courtyard of the, his prison cell with a bust of Bongobundhu by the Amilik government during their tenure in office in 1996 to 2001. Pankoj Debnath, an Amilik office bearer who was detained along with many others here in Dhaka Central Jail, could not bear to see the monument honoring such a monumentous program and its leader in such an uncared-for way. He smuggled in saplings of roses and marigold and planted 
and watered and cared for them, his own modest way of compensating for the neglect of others. Six point demand. There was a general consensus that asking for implementation of Lahore Resolution, that all India Muslim League Resolution adopted in Lahore between 22nd and 24th March 1940, read that geographically contiguous units are demarcated into regions which should be constituted with such territorial adjustments as may be necessary, that the areas in which the Muslims are in numerical a majority, as in northwestern and east zones of British India, should be grouped to constitute independent states, in which constituent units should be autonomous and sovereign. The first of the six points, the basis of the creation of Pakistan, was only fair and just. While this would mean essentially the establishment of a federation of states, the commitment and more appropriately the pledge given by Jinnah during the general election of 1946, some quarters were crying foul, labeling this as a ploy to break up Pakistan, a position which would soon become official stance of Pakistan regime. It was increasingly getting clear to the public that the fate of East Pakistan as a viable political entity within Pakistan was being held hostage in the hands of the ruling politico-military oligarchy. My short stay in West Pakistan as a Pakistan Council scholar, one of the measures of initiated to cement the bond between two wings of the country, was a stark reminder of the path that was being officially charted, a monolithic state, just the opposite of what was being tabled in East Pakistan. The second of six-point demand was more a corollary of the first the architecture of the federation. It was proposed that while the federal government would retain control of defense and foreign affairs, all other subjects should be prerogatives of the federating states. To recall history, the cabinet mission plan in 1946, to which both the Congress and the Muslim League had agreed, stipulated that except for defense, foreign affairs and communication, all the other would be state subjects. There was no denying that once the concept of federation was accepted, commonness and indivisibility of the interest of federating units would determine the federal subjects. I could hear occasional voices of difference from those taking a communal view of these issues and bringing up the solidarity of Pakistan and the unity of Muslims as a way of disgracing from any rational debate. Personally, I have no love lost for any platform for pan-Islamism, be it South Asian, Asian or global, although I was still searching for the basis for the inevitable but not inviolable division of globe into what might be called independent countries. Or pick up from history, the concept of sovereign state as envisaged under the Treaty of Westphalia. The three other points outlining the basic economic architecture, policy and institution of Federation of Pakistan were, I was told, the work of some of the finest economists of East Pakistan, notable among them Harvard-educated Dr. Nurul Islam and Dr. Anisur Rahman and Professor Rahman Subhan from the London School of Economics, all three my teachers. The critical issues covered under these demands were, Currency, tax, and foreign trade later summed up under what came to be known as the theory of two economies. The argument went like this. The two wings of Pakistan, separated over thousand miles, often termed as hostile territory, were separate and distinct macroeconomics unit with minimal scope for integration. In fact, to think of them as single economic entity was irrational and designing policies to integrate them was an exercise in absurdity. From such a premise followed the likely solution to the economic oaths of East Pakistan in the framework of a federation. States to have the sole power to impose and collect taxes, 
but by law contribute to the federal government currency management to be separate and foreign trade claims and transaction done in separate accounts given the economic exploitation of east pakistan like a colony now evident in the statistical estimates of transfer of income and wealth from east pakistan over two decades and the conspicuous disparity in standards of living between two wings to which i was a witness insistence on the status quo in the name of unity of pakistan and muslim was an obvious political shenanigan undermining in the final analysis the edifice of pakistan east pakistan stood on the margin of an absurd construct pakistan denied any meaningful participation in the management of the country civil or military the last of six point demand was the establishment of a state paramilitary force to strengthen the security of east pakistan a move made against the background of the indo pakistan war of september 1965 when the eastern wing was left virtually undefended the pakistan authorities raised alarm saying that this was one more ploy towards break up of the country they went to the extent of propounding a strategic theory that the defense of the eastern wing lay in the defense of western wing and the pakistan armed forces would march triumphantly to delhi if india dared open a front in the eastern theater stretching their capability far too wide and thin to us this appeared less a plausible theory than an attempt to fool us not that we were living under any imminent threat of an indian invasion but this convoluted strategic theory was one more instance of pakistan establishment treating east pakistan not as equal but as dispensable if only east pakistan would stay safe by the time i found a job of a lecturer in economics in 1966 at dhaka university The movement for autonomy was fast gaining momentum. Being a teacher, some of those debates interested me academically too. Quite often, teachers' cafeteria in university became the venue for animated political discussion, the most important six-point charter of demand for realizing the political and economic aspiration of East Pakistan articulated by the Awami League. I was gradually being drawn into it, particularly because I dealt with some key economic questions that were being raised even in classrooms. On the occasion I raised these issues with Ms Nargis Sabit a friend and colleague teaching political science hoping she would bring a different perspective to them the place was the teachers cafeteria during breaks as we sat down and asked for tea and samosa one of us would start what's up where is the country heading i would nudge Nargis to take the lead and continue give me some perspective from your discipline Has the idea of federalism been taken too far in the Six Point Charter? Nargis would take a scholarly pause and say, "There isn't a unique architecture for federalism. It has to be customized to suit the particular political and socio-economic context." For instance, the physical separation of the two wings of Pakistan by a distance of over a thousand miles is unique. The Lahore Resolution. was carefully designed to find a an eventual and lasting solution to this unique context then why are the pakistani authorities so adamant in sticking to the status quo i would interject well tawfiq you know as well as i do it's all about power with the army in charge we better forget the lahore resolution they have managed for two decades putting it under the carpet and you think they will revisit it now in fact we refer to a thousand mile long distance as if it's a number no my dear there lies the apple of discord she would continue i would straighten up at her valedictory statement the distance between the two wings of pakistan sums it up all she would say euphemistically and continue The difference in language, culture, socio-economic conditions, endowments, and legacies are rooted in such physical separation. In fact, independent countries are often conceived on such basis. I would get a jerk at her suggestions. 
You had asked for some academic perspective. I'm not trying to read the future, Nargis would assert. Then where does a two-nation theory stand? The basis for the partition of India. Nargis would not take this provocation of mine and continue. Stop this nonsense. Islam as the basis of nationhood? Look around the world. How many independent countries are there? Many of them contiguous, with Muslims at majority. Are they one nation? How often have they spilled each other's blood? But there was a great support for the two-nation theory, even among the people of East Pakistan, I would add. Nargis was undeterred. In the broad swath of history, on many occasions, a dominant mood takes hold for some time, forges unity, most of them under perceived threats, real or imaginary. Such was the condition when India was partitioned. That mood was long dissipated under the tyranny of the Pakistan establishment. A bold finale. It was Nargis's turn to ask my views on the burning economic questions. Well, Taufik, tell me, what do your books say about managing such country divided as it is in two wings? If it were a bird, certainly two wings are needed, I would snap. Let's get serious. What would be the guiding principles for managing such an economy? Nargis would push ahead. I have difficulty with your question. You have presumed that Pakistan consists of a single economy, I retorted. Well, one country should have one economy. Isn't that the cardinal principle? A straightforward question from Nargis. I paused to reflect and added, You are right and also wrong. We have a more complex conundrum in context of federalism. The same macroeconomic policy should apply for a country. This was the rationale, more appropriately the excuse for Pakistan being run as one economic entity which has united the ruling oligarchy to enrich West Pakistan, the Punjab in particular, and themselves not excluded. Taxes imposed from the center have been mostly spent in West Pakistan. One central bank and one currency have provided the unique opportunity to gain control over all foreign exchanges, mostly earned by our jute and jute products, and move capital freely from eastern wing to the western through the single currency tunnel. Beside interwing trade, there is no scope for economic benefit to be shared. I would stop. Nargis gave me an appreciative look and nodded. But I was not finished yet and continued. At times, numbers speak volumes. Per capita income of East Pakistan is just about half of West Pakistan. Though our jute is the lifeline of Pakistan's economy, they are not only siphoning off the financial capital, but planning to build a new capital of Pakistan, secured in the heartland of Punjab, with equal contributions from both the wings. Let me give one other example that highlights the disparity I'm talking about. How we are being short-changed and taken for a ride in name of one Pakistan. Pakistani rulers have settled their dispute with India regarding the waters of Indus and its tributaries that flow through both the countries and signed the Indus Basin Treaty. Now they plan to build the huge Tarbala Dam in West Pakistan at a cost of US dollar 1.5 billion to, among others, generate 3,500 megawatt of electricity, almost 10 times of the total power generation of East Pakistan now. Just one more example of their chicanery. I could go on and on. You cannot have relations with trust in such short supply. Then you agree to the six-point demand. Nargis nudged me to take a position. Do we have any choice? Yes, I answered. By then, we have been joined by an elderly-looking professor of Bangla. He had been listening to our conversation with rapt attention without uttering a word. Finally, he interjected. You seem to see the problem rooted in the high ideals of federalism. No, my dear. It is more basic than that. He paused, upping the ante 
and continued. You remember the dispute about the national language of Pakistan in 1948, only a year after the partition of India creating Pakistan when Jinnah declared in Dhaka that Urdu shall be the state language of Pakistan. I could see him getting excited and let him speak out his mind. Outrageous, but at the same time a preview of what was in planning in the name of Pakistan. We are the majority in Pakistan and speak Bangla, our language for over a millennium. It is our personal, social and cultural identity. And the first thing Jinnah does is try stripping us of what we are, stabbing at our soul as if the bloodbath of partition has not been enough. The professor took a sip of water and continued. You know what happened later. East Pakistanis, particularly the students, thronged the street in protest from the remote townships to the provincial capital Dhaka, demanding Jinnah take back his words. The government wanted to quell the protests by the threat of power and later actual use of it. We didn't give in but paid in blood and Bangla was recognized as one of the state languages of Pakistan. I interrupted saying the language story was closed. The professor gave me a searching look and said, You think so? No way. The duplicity of Pakistani government is a many-headed hydra. The answer is unraveling now in the six-point demand. Couldn't agree more. Nargis and I joined in to lend our support to his trenchant logic. Once while we are deeply engrossed in such discussions, a bearded teacher of Islamic studies, overhearing us, moved closer. Interesting discussion. Sorry to have been eavesdropping. Not a good practice according to Islam, he said. We felt concerned since the Pakistani rulers were known to have their agents planted everywhere. I took a defensive stance. These were mere academic discussions, nothing to do with politics. That my prospects of joining the civil service would be in jeopardy in such discussions were ever reported to the intelligence agencies gave me an adrenaline shock. Nothing wrong in academic debates. They help clarify issues and find solutions. The Maulana continued. We are advised to go even to China in search of knowledge. We were impressed by his ecclesiasm. Let me put two specific arguments and hear your reactions. The birth of Pakistan was a historic necessity, given the exploitation that Muslims of India had to bear with Hindu domination, abetted by the British. Moreover, Islam, unlike other religions, is a code of conduct for individuals as well for the society. Its precepts, if we follow, could be the bridge to unite the two wings. We can realize the ideals of Islam under the banner of Pakistan and offer the world an alternative. He continued, looking at me questioningly, avoiding direct look at a woman in strict compliance with Islamic practices. Nargis was spared. I did not want to get into a debate with him, not knowing him that well. You may like to get a reality check. Have the East Pakistanis come out of the clutches of exploiters now? How far has the Islamic bridge progressed from the wish list of 1947? I wanted to remain vague and end the discussion. Dispirited, the Maulana left. Another day in the teacher's cafeteria, Hawk, a newly appointed lecturer of sociology, a subject we didn't take seriously, joined our discussions. A debonair gentleman with modest manner, he had a unique perspective. I see the events with silver linings. He would comment, drawing the attention of the group trying to understand the unfolding tide of events. Hawk would continue in soft and grossing manner. The debate on language has rewakened us. We can see a renaissance in literature, art, music, reinventing our heritage, our lineage, and creating in process the whole new genre. Individuals and communities come with their best when challenged. What better way to do that than by trying to rob our first order of identity, language. Larger identities are built on this building block. The Pakis have done us a favor. We are in such throes of reclaiming ourselves. I offered Mr. Hawk a cigarette and lit one myself. 
the discussion was getting into a new direction, promise of a future amidst political turmoil. We let Mr. Hawk continue. The groundswell of political agitation needs a leader to take charge. We are lucky that Sheikh Mujib is emerging as the undisputed leader. In many instances in history, political movements have been met a premature end because there were no one leader. On the contrary, one too many. We wanted Hawk to elaborate further, but I couldn't resist making an argument. We see Sheikh Mujibur Rahman appearing on our political scene with increasing prominence from the language movement to the six-point demand, rising like a star, articulating our political stance while taking charge. He has built a powerful political party, the Aumi League, with grassroots following to carry forward the movement and realize the demands. I'm told he spent most of his youth in jail in pursuit of his goals when he clashed with the establishment. History doesn't play an empty hand. I stopped to let Hawk go ahead. Well, Taufik Bhai, we both are making the same point in different ways. We have in place the recipe for great achievement. A charismatic leader in Sheikh Mujib, well articulated and argued political goals, a nation rallying behind him. The movement is deep and wide and the public pulse is Sheikh Mujib's sixth sense. The convergence of these elements does not happen often. I can see history's hand. Yes, God does not play dices with universe, as Einstein said. But then, his game plan is eternal quest of man. The class bell ring, and we call it a day. I went about my life as planned, and after two years of teaching in Dhaka University, headed for Lahore to start my career as a member of the much coveted civil service of Pakistan cadre. But unwittingly, we had been co-opted to the debate raging across the country and the demand of autonomy of East Pakistan. The elite academy at Lahore, housed in the mansion of the British Lieutenant Governor, was witnessing heated arguments among the CSP probationers about the right so far denied to East Pakistan. The first signs of gathering storm in the top echelons of the bureaucracy. The 30-odd members of Civil and Foreign Services of Pakistan of 1968 were to be like their predecessors, the anchors of the central government and the standard bearers of one Pakistan, wielding powers, symbolic and actual, to achieve their mission. We were a pampered lot. To introduce us to the land that we were to govern, a special train was arranged to take us through the length and breadth of West Pakistan meeting officials, visiting places, and infusing in ourselves the confidence required of us. The train took us from Peshawar to Karachi, a stretch of a thousand miles, stopping at important places, disrupting the normal train schedules, waiting overnight at a station, our hotel on the wheels. One incident, we were taken to the naval headquarters at Karachi to be addressed by Pakistani naval chief. The admiral, in his crisp English accent, gave us a lecture on the strategy to defend Pakistan and the role of Navy whose headquarters were in Karachi. During the question-answer session, I raised my hand. You do not have any naval presence in East Pakistan, which is 2,000 miles away by the sea. How do you intend to defend its shores in case of any hostilities? The admiral didn't look kindly at my question, paused and replied. The defense of East Pakistan lies in protecting the western wing and threatening the western flank of India with a massive force with Delhi at a striking distance. This will draw the Indian army, leaving East Pakistan safe. The admiral felt assured that he has given a strategic answer to a novice in warfare. I saw through his convoluted reply a cataract vision of security. One more example of the dismissive attitude towards East Pakistan. The train stopped at Hyderabad, the old city of Mehran, once the part of the ancient Moyura Empire, to which much of East Pakistan also belonged. The Sindhis lost out to the Punjabis when all the four provinces, Punjab, Frontier, Baluchistan and Sindh, were merged into one unit of West Pakistan, to weigh against East Pakistan, which still was the majority. 
sin left cheated this is how s a samad a colleague of ours recalled an incident sindh trying to reclaim its status in 1968 69 i was posted as assistant commissioner in makli hills subdivision of thatta district in pakistan the country was under the martial law all of what was then west pakistan constituted one province under the so called one unit the new military ruler yahya khan had just set up a commission to review the status of old provinces like the punjab sindh baluchistan etc a retired president of the country was the chairman of the commission with many other members sindh was fighting hard to regain its old status as a province and there were strong popular movements for this kudrut e ilahi choudhury a csp officer of the 1964 batch was the additional deputy commissioner of hyderabad which used to be the capital of the old sindh province hyderabad became the epicenter of the movement for the restoration of sindh as the separate province kudrut was a very conscientious person at first he politely declined to take the responsibility but the sindhi leader were insistent and would not listen to the objection finally they were able to persuade him to take up the task i got a call from kudrut who asked me to assist him in preparing a draft on the subject he made sure that i gave him some time during the weekend and do the research with him in his official residence in hyderabad which was 60 miles from makli hills my residence i had an easy job at makli hills and started going to kudrut's house at regular intervals i discovered a new kudrut altogether he became so deeply engrossed in the subject and started devoting so much time in going through old records district manuals gadgeteers etc that it seemed his entire life depended on the survival of sindh as a province of pakistan i became something of a research assistant to him at dhaka university kudrut had been a happy go lucky type of student he was very good as a student but gave the impression of a casual one he laughed and joked most of the time on campus and was friendly to all but here i found an altogether different personality serious committed and fully driven by the task assigned to him by the sindh political leadership it was a testimony to his honesty and integrity that such an important issue was now his responsibility a bengali non sindhi speaking and belonging to all pakistan service the civil service of pakistan csp a sindhi politician academic or activist would have been ordinarily a natural choice kudrut more than lived up to the trust and confidence reposed in him after a month's work he finally put together a draft on why sindh should be a province and shared it with the leaders ayub khuro peer of pagaro peer of hala jam sadek ali et al They endorsed the draft and informed him that the following week the full commission headed by Fazal Ilahi Choudhury who would one day be president of Pakistan would come for the final hearing and Kudrut would have to make the presentation the meeting would take place in the one unit building in Hyderabad Kudrut called me and explained the importance of the event Samad we must not let them down he said We have to treat this as our own problem and be prepared to answer supplementary questions. I will of course do the main presentation. So be it I thought. I did not have too much to do. I simply noted that Muhammad bin Qasim had landed in Thatta and that was being of Islamic rule in the subcontinent. Also the largest graveyard of the world was in Sonda nearby. I put on a good suit and drove to Hyderabad on the appointed date. Kudrut was ready and we went to an one unit building ahead of time. The full commission was there and a clerk asked us and a clerk asked for the presentation of the case of Sindh. When Kudrut went up to the stage, the members looked like a little perplexed. They naturally had expected a Sindhi leader to do the job, but lo and behold, a young Bengali civil servant. Kudrut was fully prepared for this big day. and made a brilliant presentation of his painstaking research in about half an hour's time his argument supported by documents and history were so irrefutable that there were no questions the whole thing for which kudrut has prepared for 
three months was over in 45 minutes. The chair thanked all and closed the meeting around 1 p.m. The Sindhi leaders were euphoric and lifted Kudrat on, his sho- on their shoulders. Kudrat Sahib, aapne kamal kiya, marhaba, and shukriya. Mr. Kudrat, you have done a miracle. Bravo, and thanks a million. I had some work in Thatta, so I begged leave of Kudrat and went back to Makli Hills. But I was also so impressed by the whole show that it left an indelible imprint in my mind. In the evening, as I was playing tennis at the club, I heard an announcement on the radio about the decision to recommend the revival of Sindh as a province of Pakistan. Wow! Instant success! I called Kudrat and congratulated him on the success of his crowning efforts. In life, things happen which may seem trivial but actually carry profound significance. The choice of Kudrat Elahi Chaudhary for presenting Sindh's case can perhaps be cited as one. He was a CSP officer of the 1964 batch. He had no adversaries and he had a smiling face. I was privileged to know him. I perceived an instant liking for Sindh, home of Sufis and the eclectic face of religion. The laid-back, unharried lives of the Sindhis seemed wrapped in antiquity, caught in a time machine. They seemed close to us, yet so far away. The Deputy Commissioner of Hyderabad invited us for an afternoon tea followed by musical soiree by local artists on the meticulously manicured lawn of his residence. A dark turban villager with a long handlebar moustache in pensive meditation sang the legendary tragic romance of Sassi Pannu. Beseeching the lover to stay for the night before the heaven's gate close, the lugubrious entreat still rings in my ear. I felt at home that afternoon, finding the affinity in the depth of heart of Sindh and Bengal. Later, back in Lahore, I was called to the office of the deputy director of the academy. As I walked into his office, a teak paneled, heavily carpeted chamber, he waved me to sit down. Moments of silence, as if I was awaiting sentencing in a court, he looked up and asked, What did you do at the Neville headquarters at Karachi? I was taken by surprise, got back my composure and could only recall the question answer with the Neville chief of staff, which I narrated. The deputy director looked at me with avuncular affection and said, Taufik, you have joined the civil service of Pakistan to be its guardian, not a critic. Be more tactful in future. Without waiting for any answer, he dismissed me. I knew in my heart that my loyalty to Pakistan was already waning. The momentum for the six-point demand was gaining and kind of a force that was streaming into the veins of all East Pakistanis, energizing them, inspiring them. Here was a political upheaval managed with the masterly strategy and tact by Sheikh Mujib that was fraught into immense personal risks. But he was not one to be cowed down. This was truly a test of strength between a well-articulated political program embraced by a population and a brute force that wanted its way. Our group of 30 CSP and PFS probationers had a closer shave with reality in 1969 when we were heading for Kumilla to Dhaka by train after our attachment at the Rural Academy. Early in the evening, protesters had laid siege along railway lines, burning some of the carriages. With all the lights switched off and windows down, our train was trapped God knows where. While the East Pakistani officers were tense, but at the same time excited, the West Pakistanis, never exposed to such momentous turmoil, were panicky, fear writ large on their faces. We belonged here and they were aliens. Back in Dhaka, when we were parting at Tejgao Airport, 
I recall having told some of my PFS colleagues that the next time we meet, we might be citizens of two different countries. General Ayub Khan, President of Pakistan, faced with rising discontent and surge of political support to the Army League's demand, handed over power to another general, Yahya Khan, in 1969, while announcing over radio that he could not preside over the dismemberment of Pakistan. Protest continued unabated as I moved along my career path. In late 1970, I was posted as a subdivisional officer, SDO, of Meherpur, the smallest in East Pakistan, a truncated leftover from Krishnanagar district in India. Although by practice, I was to be assigned more important places, Chandpur, Narayan Ganj, Brahman Barya, and the like, given that I was first in my batch of CSP from East Pakistan. As I was preparing to leave Dinajpur to join my new post, a colleague jokingly commented that I was going to be glorified circle officer. It was demeaning to be relegated to such an inferior role having made it to the CSP. I brushed aside his comment with a smile, although in my mind the meeting at the naval headquarters in Karachi flashed by. This ignominy could well be a pointer that I was under watch. At the general election held on 7 December, the Army League led by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman secured 167 out of 169 seats in East Pakistan, giving it the majority in Pakistan to form the government. The Army League also won 288 of 300 seats of the Provincial Assembly. In my mind, I was sure that the ruling elite of Pakistan would never agree to this electoral outcome and accept Sheikh Mujibur Rahman as the Prime Minister of Pakistan. The Pakistani military janta was playing the one bluff after another as they were preparing to play their last hand. March 7, 1971 It's been a very eventful and exciting day. I'm in Dhaka on my official visit from Meher. An excuse made out to be here to get a first-hand feel of what's happening in this provincial capital. Amid hectic political parlays between the military janta and the army league led by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, already anointed as Bangabandhu, to find a political solution to the impasse, rooted in the irreconcilable goal of the army to either rule directly or through its political surrogates in West Pakistan, and Bangabandhu's insistence to honor the democratic outcomes of the national election. Dhaka is abuzz with rumors of all kinds. Declaration of independence of Eastern Wing can come anytime soon. Pak Army is buying time while it brings reinforcements of troops and supplies by sea and air, and a military crackdown is imminent. I go steadily, lest I am discovered for what would be seen as a serious breach of discipline a public official attending a political meeting to the race course where the most important event till date was to take place. New direction to be announced by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, already endearingly anointed as Bangabandhu, friend of Bengal, in a public meeting. The spacious ground of the race course is today like the giant arena of a Roman Colosseum, with the gladiators getting ready for the last deadly fight. Its layout with its surrounding present an eerie parallel, starting from the eastern end, going clockwise. First, the Victorian High Court, its domes rising high above the rain trees. Next stands the Carson Hall, a university building housing science faculties, a pleasant brick-red architectural blend of the Mughal and the Victorian. Next, two pillars and their extended bases on the sides of the main road all that are left of a gate that Mughals had built. Close to them are the mosque and the tomb of Haji Shahbaz. Then stands the Burdawan house built by the Maharaja of Burdawan for his residence when he came to Dhaka to attend the meeting after partition of Bengal in 1905, now housing Bangla Academy. We have come half circle at the Atomic Energy Commission, a chic modern building, as our footprint at the frontier of science. 
Next in a line on the other end of the circle are three structures hugging together, all representing the arrival of architectural modernism, the Teacher-Student Center, TSC, with two Greek cenotaphs on the edge of its lawn, the University Library and the Institute of Fine Arts, and a Kali Mundir. Across the street, at the far end of the race course, is an added charm, the abandoned Najkars of the Nawabs and a trendy shopping center with a Chinese restaurant called Shakura, rendezvous for the young romantics stand next to Shabak, the first modern hotel in Dhaka and across. Its unsellable rival, icon of modern era, Hotel Intercontinental, the Dhaka Gymkhana Club, a legacy of British wherever they lived, is the hotel's elite neighbor and the circle comes complete at the botanical garden popularly known as Ramna Garden, which had, in 1961, hosted a reception to Queen Elizabeth, which I attended as a teenager. The centuries of history frozen in the architectural swath come alive to me, standing in full view, in silence, to witness a momentous event. What a real-life setting, envy of any film director, to play out the last act of drama that started most recent with the Battle of Palashi, with the Battle of Plessy. When the East India Company defeated the army of Nawab, Shiraj Dullah, over two centuries earlier, I am overwhelmed by the enormity of the moment I am to witness. A late spring afternoon bathing in bright sunshine, processions after processions, of hundreds of thousands of people keep converging with banner floating like sails, chanting defiant slogan with countless fists like specks of waves flickering in the distant ocean. Soon it becomes a sea of humanity, the race course where the British Raj enjoyed their weekends and horse races, recollecting the many derbies they missed back home, is playing host to the most daring of all gambles, the destiny of a nation. There are whispers in the crowd that Pakistan army may crack down. Even an airstrike is not ruled out. I chose to stand on a sideline across the TSC, ready to run if such an event were to take place. The speeches have already started. The flag of Bangladesh, designed by the students, is raised on the podium amid thunderous applause. But all were waiting to hear Bongo Bundhu. Then comes a thunderous voice. My brothers, the crowd stands frozen. In a short, spellbinding speech, in his baritone voice, hallmark diction, and laconic yet pithy style that endeared him in the hearts of Bengalis, Bangabundhu gives the background behind the nation's arrival at this historic crossroads. He recounts the latency of deceptions, exploitation, and repression meted out to the people of Bangladesh by the ruling Pakistani Janta whenever they stood up for their rights. The story read poignantly with the blood of countless many. Even after Army League won the election, the majority in Pakistan, General Yahya, was going by the urgings of Bhutto and had postponed calling the assembly into session. Now the date has been set for 25th March, when the people responded to the call for peaceful strikes, closed down factories and offices, spontaneously came out in the streets with the vow to continue their movement. They were counted with point-blank shots by the weapon bought by the sweats of their brow, presumably to save them from the external enemy. General Yahya, you are the President of Pakistan. Come and see how your troops have fired upon the innocent people, butchering them, the air still heavy with the wails of mothers. Yet Bangladeshis are being blamed. What a travesty of truth. Bangabundhu calls for transfer of power to the elected representative of people, withdrawal of martial law and the troops to the barrack. I noted carefully, not once did he use the term East Pakistan. He calls for total shutdown of Bangladesh for indefinite period. Government, semi-government offices, courts, including Supreme Courts, are to remain closed. No taxes are to be paid. Employees are to get their salaries before the month is out. 
Next come his directives for the future struggle. Tomader por kache amar onurodh hoilo. Hoste ghore ghore dulko gore tolo. Tomader cha kichu ache tai niye shotrur mukabala korte hobe. Make each of your homes a fortress. You shall have to fight the enemy with whatever you have. We shall starve them to defeat. Our waters shall be their cemeteries. None can cow us down once we have learned to lay down our lives for a just cause. This Bengal is home to all. We are brothers, Muslims and Hindus. It is our sacred duty to take care of those who are not Bengalis. We have to live up to our ideals. His final passionate call. Get ready to fight. Ebare sangram amader mukti sangram. This time, it's the fight for our liberty. It's for our independence. Then his hand raised to the sky, and one last clarion call. Joy, Bangla! Victory to Bengal! Two million thunderous voices roar. Joy, Bangla! The die is cast. Bongo Bundu in my eye. Transform. from a brilliant strategist and politician to become the undisputed leader of the independent movement of Bangladesh i am the sdo of meherpur the custodian of powers of the central government of pakistan its pampered surrogate in a remote corner that day at the race course bongo bondhu the pipe piper leads me to cross the rubicon like millions others i am drawn in in the vortex of the revolution the freedom fighter in me is born and so also in hundreds of thousands more born in where we lived was a suburb some distance from the city where all the actions were i went to khalid bhai's place a friend of mejo bhai met his father khalu professor shamshul haq retired vice chancellor of rajshahi university my excitement seemed to have overwhelmed him What's up? You sound more like a political activist than a civil servant in charge of a subdivision. Kalu, Pakistan is living on borrowed time. I have been to the race course to listen to Bongo Bondhu. His electrifying speech asking people to get ready to make sacrifices for independence and the thunderous applause from over 2 million people braving the fear of Pakistani reprisals are the testimonies to what lies ahead. How is that going to affect you? What are you up to? I could see his filial apprehension in him. I'm going to throw in my lot with the movement for Bangladesh. I can see a sea of blood on the horizon. Like the rest of Bengalis, I'm not going to be intimidated by guns and bayonets. I paused and then continued. A war is in offing and it's going to be a very bloody one. We are going to lose initially. and cross over to india for sanctuary i shall not forget to take the money at my custody in the treasury believe me khalu we shall be back to reclaim our land god bless you take care my son he gave me an affectionate pat on my back i felt my father's touch after dusk i was loitering around road 32 of dhanmondi residence of bongobondhu it was dark i got an eerie feeling with shadows moving around the bushes and the shades of trees Suddenly I caught sight of Shiraj Bhai a leading student political leader and an ideologue as I moved towards him I noticed isn't it Taufik what are you doing here I don't think you know that I am the SDO of Meherpur bordering India if ever you need refuge you are most welcome if I could be of any help count on me I did not feel safe to carry on with the conversation and quickly left I had an uncanny feeling that it would be long before I come back to Dhaka and it was not going to be the same again. A sense of farewell came upon me. Our large family of 5 brothers and 2 sisters had by then undergone what resembled the parallel of a biological cell division. The eldest, Mahmud, having finished his studies, joined the service of the Central Government of Pakistan and was posted at Islamabad. the abode of islam and the new upcoming capital on the pathohar plateau near the citadel of army the rawalpindi cantonment another bone of contention between two wings of pakistan 
where East Pakistan was equally paying for a capital city being built thousand miles removed across India. The next in line, Kudrat, after having served in West Pakistan as a member of elite civil service, had returned to East Pakistan and was posted at Ratshahi, quite a distance from Dhaka. Fatima, my elder sister, was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where her husband was on a program with Harvard University. My younger sister, Rahima, was in Sialkot, West Pakistan, with her husband, a major in Pakistan Army. My two younger brothers, Jahangir and Shah Jahan, were staying with my mother at Bonani and attending schools. I was the last adult to leave the family when I joined the civil service of Pakistan in 1968. My father was proud, not allowed though, in seeing his children achieve the best aspiration of a middle-class family. Having retired from public service, he misses me a lot and felt lonely when I left for Lahore, as my mother recounted. He used to talk about you, more like a son about his father. He would wait for you at dinner table as if you were to return from the club that you used to go to. Then with a sigh, he would nibble at the meal on his table. You two had changed roles and he felt insecure without you. He was very glad that you bought him the English soap, the toothpaste and the towel before you left. I recalled with some effort that before I left for Lahore, I had been to Newmarket and in haste, didn't know why, had bought a few small things for my father, an incident I had almost forgotten. I was glad beyond measure to hear my mother mention that. My father lived for 13 more days after I was gone. I guess you are leaving tomorrow. When are you coming back again? My mother asked as I was preparing to leave for Meherpur the next day with my two school-going brothers under her care. I do not know. Moreover, you can see where the country is heading. Disaster, to put it mildly. I wished I had not said that. Her apprehensions showed up in the sudden rush of pale in her round, turmeric face. She pulled me closer to her, put her hand softly on my head, and while running her fingers through my hair, continued. Beta, I do not quite make sense of the situation. You know, it is only we in Silet who went to the referendum to join Pakistan when the British partitioned India. I wish I could give you a feel of those exciting days. We voted with our feet for a country so endearing, we looked so up to. Then, I do not know why, everything seems to have gone wrong. I interrupted. Amma, it's pretty simple. The West Pakistanis, particularly the Punjabis, never treated us equals. Though, thought of East Pakistan, their zamindari, they, the landlords. They exploited our resources to build their part. Now that there is possibility of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman becoming the Prime Minister of Pakistan, they have gone berserk, afraid of losing their grip on power. But we are all Muslims, brothers, tied by our religion, which even lays down how we should treat each other. Amma, this religious bogey, they have used to put all other issues under the carpet. When any demand is raised, you can hear their loud, hypocritical cry, Pakistan is in danger, Islam is at risk. Baba, this is intriguing. But besides, Pakistan is for all, minorities too. We have long lived in peace with others in East Pakistan. You remember, you had more Hindu friends in Nauga Jhuntu, Dilip, Momota, and all the rest. Their mothers, your Mashimas and Pishimas, were my best friends too. I remember the eclecticism of my mother, a devout Muslim, never missing a prayer or any calling of Islam, always pulling her sari over her head in graceful moderation, making sure that we learn to read the Quran before our teens, reminding us about our prayers when it was time yet so warm towards all. Her world was far away from the tyrannies in the name of Islam. Amma, you're one in a million, but reality is so different now that we have to brace up to a dangerous time. Again, the slip of a word alarmed her. But in any case, you are a civil servant. Don't get yourself mixed up in politics. I'm concerned about you both. Baki, my mejubhai, you have been through trouble once with the army and now had to leave us for Rajshahi and Dinajpur. Your father had an encounter with the army too in Dinajpur. Allah had brought us all together and he knows best why. 
He took both of you away from me, but promised me that you would stay out of trouble. I saw her watery eyes, entreating for some assurance. I shall keep your advice close to my heart. Next day, I left Dhaka early morning for Meherpur in my Toyota Land Cruiser with my driver Piaro on the steering. In about 3 hours we reached the Aricha Ghat on the bank of Podda. The ride in the ferry on the windswept upper deck was like a cool shower after a hot days of political waiting game at Dhaka. The mighty Podda, known more endearingly as the Ganga Ma, in her long torturous journey from the glaciers of the Tibetan heights through the plains of northern and eastern India and eastern Pakistan her final lap to the bay of bengal was like one umbilical cord torn by men over centuries in search of their evolving identities recalling the long span of time and the never ending journey of podda seemed to have calmed my excited soul heavy with uncertainties about the future after i landed off the ferry i instantly decided to take a look at one more witness to the flow of time to bogura i told piaro which would be an eastward diversion of 20 miles away from my road to meherpur are you sure sir piaro inquired while complying with my instruction yes to mohastangar i felt an inner urge to take a look at our ancient route mohastangar was our earliest and largest historic ruins i had gone past the site a few times but decided to leave the visit for another occasion this time a sense of history drove me towards it on the western side of river korotwa a tributary of the river jomuna lay buried at mohastangar over 2 millennia of our past here under the piles of the earth was the ancient city of purdanagara founded by the mighty moira dynasty in 300 bc i stood on the high bank of korotwa to have a clear view at the swath of scattered mounds interspersed by low bushes and occasional trees the walled city spread over 2 square miles was bounded by high rampart with a moat going round and further away the river korotwa the two lines of defense to protect the city signaling its wealth and importance the lesser people lived outside the walls stretching over many miles the fortunes of this ancient city rose and dipped over 1000 years in its life a succession of rulers built pundranagar to their tastes the moiras the guptas the palas the sens the mughals buddhists hindus and muslims left their marks on this city which in place have lacquered over one another in a historic embrace the moiras originating from magda modern bihar and bengal took advantage of the disruption and power vacuum in the wake of westward withdrawal of the armies of alexander the great and expanded their domain to establish in 322 bc the largest and the most powerful political and military empire of ancient india in this military adventure chandragupta maurya was advised by a brilliant strategist and military planner named kautilya also known as chanakya diplomatic zone of new delhi chanakya puri is named after him whose works compiled as arthashastra was one of the greatest ancient treatises on economics politics administration war and religion pundranagar although a settlement dating back to pre maurya days saw its birth as a city during the halikan days of mauryas the gupta emperors who ushered in the golden age of india marked by unparalleled achievement in literature art music and architectures were from bengal the court of chandragupta was graced by navaratna nine gems the most brilliant of them all kalidas india's greatest sanskrit poet sanskrit is the mother of among other languages of bengali kalidas poet and dramatist popularly known for his famous play shokuntala maharashtran flourished as a part of gupta golden era and later continued to host the dynasties of palas the sens and the sultanate and the mughals the tombs of the mysterious saint named shah sultan maheshwar 
meaning one who came floating on a boat, and the mosque built by the Mughal emperor Farooq Shiar were the last accession to its past glories. Among the ancient Moyura rulers, Emperor Ashoka's time strangely echoed through the depth of history. Ashoka, the great strategist, the conqueror and the warrior, had his sights on the prosperous territories of Kalinga, still not under the Maurya rule. Emperor Ashoka went on to wage his first war in the ninth year of his reign, also his last, in 264 BC, commanding a vast army on foot, horses and elephants against the much smaller yet determined army of Kalinga. The plains that lay between Dahuli Hills and the Doya River, 8 kilometers south of Bhubaneswar, Odisha, were to witness one of the most epochal wars of antiquity. A deadly and savage engagement ensued where even the women and children joined the Kalinga army to keep open their supply lines. The end was all but known. The Mauryas liquidated the Kalingas and won equivocally. Emperor Ashoka looked around the conquered battlefield and beyond. The trophies of his victory, 100,000 Kalingas, including civilians, slain. 10,000 of Ashoka's own warriors. The wet earth smelled only of blood while the Daya turned red. Bodies and parts of young soldiers, even women and children, littered all around mingled with the corpses of horses and elephants, testimonies to the savageries that the war had wrought. The stench of flesh of men and animals had already brought vultures circling above and ready to feast. The eerie silence was only broken by the occasionally breathing groans of the wounded, crying out for last help. Remorse, guilt and a sense of penance were crushing Ashoka the carnage he has commanded, the macabre mayhem he had choreographed, buried dreams in the piles of deaths, love decimated in blood, affection severed in pains, all hauntingly mocked at his victory. A reborn Ashoka vowed never again to take up arms, renounced violence and embraced Buddhism and its tenets of truth, charity, kindness, purity and goodness. Ahimsa, non-violence, became the abiding principle of his life. Dharma Vijaya, victory through Dharma, and not Dig Vijaya, victory through war, became the goal of his life. To this end, he sent son Mahendra and daughter Sangamitra as missionaries to Ceylon and others as far as Syria, Egypt, and Macedonia with his message of peace. His devotion to the good of all living beings earned him the endearing name of Devanam Priya, Priyadarshi. India honors him by adopting the Ashoka Chakra of Saranath as her national emblem and flies it in the national flag. 2,200 years later, I was heading back to Meherpur with the same non-violence edict in a reverse order, hoping it would make the enemy abandon the path of violence. Finding no ones to share my thoughts with, I turned to Piero who was standing behind me and said, Do you know that there was once a beautiful city here 2300 years ago? A city? I can only see some mounds, bushes and wasteland as far as eyes can go. Take my word, and its name was Pundranagar, and it is buried here. You see those scattered diggings. Those are excavation to find out what lies underneath. Piero, believing my words, went further. At this pace, I shall not live to see the city. I agree. This is one more example of utter neglect shown by the West Pakistanis. First identified by Sir Alexander Cunningham in 1879 as the ancient city of Pundranagar, regular excavation started in 1928, only to be suspended for three decades. Excavations were again initiated in 60s, limping to say the least. Maybe government does not want us to unearth and take pride in our past. I changed to a different point. Piero, can you believe an emperor who ruled this part 2,200 years ago had the same yearnings that we are now pinning our hopes on? Who, sir? Piero looked askance. Ashoka the Great, ruler of the vast Indian Empire, with his capital at Pataliputro, today's Patna, 
2,200 years ago. Piero could not resist his temptation to reclaim his part. That's little over 100 miles from Munger, where my parents come from. Piero is from Munger, a district couple of hundred miles west of Calcutta. His family lived on the edge of dense forest in a small Adibashi settlement. They had to migrate from India during partition when the communal insanity had taken hold of India. Newborn Piero was put in a bag for ease of carriage when the parents made their knife-edge journey to East Pakistan. Through the senseless killings, I mean mounds of corpses, instant mausoleums honoring the independence of India. I paused to reflect on the event that happened long ago in 1947. Shimla, summer of 1947, saw one frail visitor, Shorkum, from distant Silet, who took a week-long journey of a thousand miles to the far-off Himalayan summer capital of British India in hope of regaining his health, a change his doctor had recommended. He was happy relaxing in a small hotel by the mall, watching the green pine and the other forest around, walking lazily along the mall, past stores, clubhouses and bars, halting at the ridge or the scandal points, catching occasional glimpse of lovers, mostly white, getting a wet embrace from the monsoon clouds turning into a sudden showers, wondering whether he would be strong enough one day to take the mile-long walk up the hills where, he was told, playful monkeys at the Honuman Temple wait for visitors to feed them. The British coined the term Queen of Hills for Shimla. To other, the name came from the goddess Shamali Devi, an incarceration of Kali. Shorkum, my Mejo Chacha, uncle, was oblivious of the gathering storm that was to draw a sharp hasty knife not only on the map of India but cut down countless lives in one swift move. The last gift to India brokered by the libertarian British government and Indian politicians. He heard whispers of shimmering communal discontent among the Hindus and the Muslim in the Himalayan heights and was advised to look for safe address by his innkeeper, preferably in some Muslim-dominated region. He moved to the plains and eventually reached Delhi to see great panic rush of the Muslims. Men, women, children, babies in arms, octogenaries latching onto the young, sick being carried on the shoulder to the highway station. He joined them. A sea of humanity was vying for place in the trains, as if it were Noah's boat about to sail, leaving the rest to fate. As the train moved on, Chacha heard how Muslims have been stabbed, bludgeoned, and shot in their homes, in the streets, in the bazaars, in the mosque. How the families packed up in great haste, whatever little they could carry, leaving behind all that they called their homes, their address for generations, the part of the earth that belonged to them and they belonged to. Chacha joined the caravan not knowing where it was heading, only to discover later that the destination was Lahore, soon to be part of Pakistan after the partition of India. Around midnight, as the train was steadily moving without any lights amid torrential rains, an hour away from the destination, it was ambushed in the killing fields of Amritsar. Next morning, charred, mutilated bodies of children, women and men were all that reached Lahore. My chacha was buried with nameless many in a cemetery in Lahore. Two decades later, as a young man of his age, I would stop at any graveyard that I happened to pass by in Lahore and spend a few silent moments remembering one I had not seen yet strongly felt about. I resumed the conversation with Piero. There you are. You come from a place loaded with history, which is shared by Mohastan Gortu. Emperor Ashoka was so despaired with the loss of lives in the Kalinga War, which he won, that he vouched never again to conquer any more territories. Instead, he embraced Buddhism and sent peace emissaries to distant places. Ahimsha was the abiding principle for the rest of his life. Non-violence is also the path that Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman has asked us to follow. But what would you do if the Pakistanis resort to violence? Piero added with a hint of apprehension. I was happy that we have struck a chord. Well, our movement is strengthened by non-cooperation. We shall not let Pakistanis rule over us. 
it's not only ahimsa there is a passive activism to defeat the enemy by denying him any legitimacy by non cooperation i stopped realizing that i might have gone too far for piaru to follow i scanned the horizon one last time beamed back from the river before heading for meherpur